Do you love me? Do you love me? I wonder if that's the question Jesus is asking us this morning. Each one of us. He looked Peter in the eye. And yes, he was restoring Peter to himself. But that was the question. Do you love me? Loving God. That's what we do. At the fall of mankind, in the Garden of Eden, love for God was replaced by self-love. And this self-love infected all human existence, including our ability to reason. And when we focus on ourselves, it's very difficult to think clearly or objectively. It obscures the truth all around us. And it is this lack of true love which corrupts our ability to know God and understand reality. The message we preach is viewed by the world as foolish. People reject the knowledge of God, not because they cannot know God, but because they will not know Him. And at the root of all disbelief is a rebellious heart. What prevents us from knowing God is our rebellion against him. People will not believe, they will not believe until they are genuinely open to exploring the truth about God. You see, unbelief is a problem of the heart rather than a problem of the head. People reject God rather than live under His authority. However, some people know that it is good to know God. It is good to know God. And I think most of us here today have understood that simple fact. It is good to know God. From the Ten Commandments forward, we know as believers that the Great Commandment is first and foremost among all of God's commandments. You see here from Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 12, Jesus was asked by one of the scribes, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. You see, nothing Nothing had changed since Moses was on Mount Sinai 1,500 years before Christ met this scribe. Nothing changed. It was still the great commandment. When you love God, it shows. Do this, do this, and all the other commandments fall into place. Notice that Jesus did not say to the scribe, Obey all commandments. That's not what he said. No, that is because the greatest commandment is all about having a relationship with God. A relationship with Him. And this relationship goes both ways. Because God loves us. 
He wants to have a relationship with us. And he wants us to love him. In return, more than we love anything else. And you can see that in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. When you love God, your life changes from the top down. And the inside out. You are transformed. And it shows. It bears fruit. <coughs> Others, they see this change in you. As fully devoted followers of Christ. And this is your witness. This is your witness. Meaning, by definition, that you are a person who has personal knowledge of God. We know that God loves us, even though we are imperfect, rebellious beings. <coughs> so how hard can it be to love a perfect God? And let's remember that Jesus, Jesus, God in the flesh, allowed himself to be tortured yes. and killed for us, taking our punishment for our sins onto himself. And you know, I've studied world religions, and it's interesting to know that all other religions say nothing about loving God. They only emphasize appeasing God. All this to say that we love because He first loved us. I'm off my words. Okay. Now where were we supposed to be? It's been a while. <laughs> Our obedience to the great commandment is not something we do once and then move on to something else. No. It's an ongoing act of obedience that stays with us our whole life and through eternity. Alex was talking about worship. Your worship demonstrates your love for God. Your worship is 24-7. It's not Sunday morning only. It's in everything you do, everything you say. That is worship. When you love God, you put Him first. And just as God spoke His creation into existence, He spoke His creation into existence. He didn't go to His workshop and laid out a plan or two. And he spoke it. He also spoke all the words we find in the Ten Commandments. He spoke it. And he said in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. So how could this happen? How can this commandment be broken? Well, unfortunately, it happens often. Anytime we put any one or anything before God, it can become our God. You know, in my first career as, a, as an Air Force pilot, it gave me the license to say that God is my co-pilot. You've probably seen the bumper sticker. Maybe you even had that bumper sticker. Well, what was I thinking? I was saying, I told God that I will accept his free gift of salvation. He can sit with me in the cockpit. He can look out the window. And he can help out in an emergency. But otherwise, he should keep his hands off of the controls because he's just the co-pilot. Well, the truth be known, he is the better pilot, and he owns the universe, 
and everything in it, and thinking that I can fly a plane better than he can is a good way to fly right into a mountain. What about the rich young man we read about in, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22? It's on the screen here. Take a minute and look at it. Pay attention to the last part of it. You know, he loved, he loved his riches more than God. And he walked away from his Savior. Because he loved his riches. Well, let's put this another way. In the parable of the dishonest manager in Luke chapter 16, verse 13 is emphasized here. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. But it's not just money. Look at another example. Mark chapter 4, 18 to 19. This is where Jesus describes where the word is sown. And in verse 18 and 19, he says, And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfaithful. You see... God doesn't want us to love riches and other things more than we love Him. It's not about our stuff. When you love God, you obey Him. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. <laughs> And I think that's about as simple as it gets. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. <coughs> Obedience is an expression of love. Pastor James spoke last week about Abraham's obedience when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. And that was righteous obedience and love for his heavenly father. Obedience is outward evidence of inward of an inward relationship with God. However, I want to warn you that delayed obedience is not obedience at all. Look at this scripture from Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. There are two statements made here. Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And then the second, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at home. That's not obedience. We should remember that God comes closer to us when we are obedient. Jesus said in this verse, John 14, 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. There is emphasis here on the word manifest because it means to disclose himself. God discloses himself to you. Do you know him? 
when you love God, you love people. This may be the hard part. The second great commandment is found in Mark 12, 31. Following the first, it says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there are no other commandments greater than loving God and loving others. You know, we show our love for God by loving other people. But think about this. Conversely, we show our disdain and disregard for God when we show our disdain and disregard for people. Case in point, look at the political climate in our country today. Look at social media. It's not very social, really. We show our love for God through generosity, through forgiveness, by opposing justice, injustice, we re by relieving suffering, by sharing the gospel, and serving others. We need to be a serving <coughs> church. When you love God, you die to yourself. Now we can accept Jesus as our Savior, but not make Him our Lord. I don't know how many times in Africa I would see people accept Jesus. And it seemed to be they were accepting Him with all of their heart. But they would not accept Him as their Lord. What's the difference? You see, often it's as far as believers will go. And there's no real commitment. The relationship is all about me. It's all about me. And God is excluded when it's all about you. We are spiritually dead. Did you know that before you came to Christ, you were spiritually dead. But when we die to self, we really start to live. The Holy Spirit and you are bound by faith. We are open. We are open to His lead in our lives. Now we are just pretending. Yep, we're just pretending until we surrender control of our lives to God. Our walk remains inconsistent. And we miss what he is saying to us. The Spirit is speaking to you. Let those who have ears hear what the Spirit is saying. Did you know when you are born again, you die to self? That's what it means. When you are born again, you die to self. God's glory becomes most important. Not our own, not our own glory. No, it's His glory. But I warn you, remember this. Don't try to use God for your own benefit because you will fail. You can reach all of your personal goals, become a great success by the world's standards, and still miss the purpose for which God created you. How tragic is that? Oops. As we finish this morning, take a look at the scripture here. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? What can you give in return for your soul? Abba Father.
Jesus looks you in the eye and he says, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? 